my passion, and I'll just tell you all right now, I always tell people up front, I'm a relic hunter. I, 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 I use a metal detector. That's what I do. But with that, I, I take great pride in care in the research I do. I never sell anything. But I have gotten really, really interested in the, in the pre-colonial, um, in the colonial times uh, activity up here, especially with the Cherokee Path, including uh, the early British pre-Rev War campaigns, and then the Williamson marches from Rev War times on, and then also the earliest times that we know of, which is the George Chicken uh, campaign, which is 1716, and some of Alexander Cummings stuff from 1730. We discovered a few of these camps there's, and I'll just tell you without giving away any, any secrets, anywhere from six mile all the way to the six and 20, uh, there, there have been some camps, um, and with 12 miles, six, and, uh, six mile creek, because it was so close to Fort Prince George being some of the biggest, they took that original Indian uh, Cherokee Trail, and the British were much like the Romans. They, they were very organized and very regimental. And most of those that are, especially the main Cherokee trading path, it is anywhere from 18 to 24 feet on the bottom, two, two inch. And usually that is from men marching six across, and they, they would have to march in precision. So you can really tell when you were on something, especially that the British had uh, come across, and then their carriages very troublesome over some of these crossings. What you would tend to look for on some of these camps is high ground near water, and a good camp is a good camp. And, and the Indians were at these camps. When we're down in the Low Country, mostly you've got Indian artifacts, you've got Rebel War artifacts, and then you've got Civil War artifacts. Because a good camp is a good camp is a good camp, and so it was just piggybacking on top of each other. And I'm amazed by it as well because it is. It has province. Every single piece over there is British military and it's pre-1760. There is nothing Rev War based. It is all early, early pieces. And it was, um, and it's really even before the punitive campaigns. And one reason we know that, one way we know that are the buttons. And after the British started numbering their regimental buttons in about 1762. And none of the buttons that we have found have been numbered up there. But this coin here is a four reals, you know, two bits, four bits, six bits a dollar. I'm sure y'all are familiar with that cheer, but the, the Spanish had half real, one real, two, four, and eight. And that is a four, which is the least minted denomination. And that's um, and that is called Pistarine style. There's the uh, coat of arms for, the, uh, for King Charles on this one on the front. But on the back, America used Spanish coins up through 1850, but what was amazing, this coin looked that probably the day it was dropped, it looked just like that. And Spanish, I mean, silver usually does not tarnish much, but it came out of the ground looking like that. And the M that you see right there is a Mexico City mint mark. But one, one little tidbit of information, those are the pillars of Hercules that you see. And that's where we get our dollar sign from. It's the S with the, the lines through that. So that's how we adopted that, that symbol, if you've ever been interested in how, how we do that. But, but so obviously a 1744 coin dates your site pretty well. That's a lead pencil. That's a pretty amazing find. That they took a musket ball and hammered it down so they use it as a writing tool. Um, British pennies, all of them were King George the Second. King George the Second is a left-facing profile, and he was from 1727 up through 1760, somewhere in that 1759, somewhere in that ballpark. So obviously you can date the site that way quite easily. They all have provenance, and, and that is one thing we try to look for when we get on the sites where a lot of times you're going to find civilian-based uh, artifacts, and this is nothing but military-based artifacts. And um, stuff that, in my opinion, it, it, it amazes me to this day, most all these big bodies of water now, they have covered up so much of our history. The issue shoe buckle for the British military were usually iron like this, or steel colored, and then the the ornate ones were officers, and you could tell they were, and they, these were brass or copper, so they were gold, they looked beautiful at the time. Same with this, all this is brass right here. And so you could just imagine, most of the time on shoe buckles like this, they were they were supplied by the, uh, by the officer themselves. And then some of the best artifacts that I think that we found are some very obscure stuff that you just do not see. You don't even see them up in the north, uh, Vermont, Rhode Island, Connecticut are these buckles right here. And since this picture was taken, I think there's four more over there. These are called neck stock buckles. And this one here has some pretty intricate graving on it. But these 
were made to fasten the cravat that the soldier had to wear. If y'all seen the, the scarf that they would wear, and those were mostly made out of wool or horse hair. And you can imagine you're walk, marching 304 miles up from Charleston in June or July and you're wearing a horse hair scarf around your neck. Those were not uh, British issue, but they were what were called necessaries. And most officers were required their, uh, the men in their regiment to have the, uh, the neck stocks on. But those buckles are extremely hard to find. They're just, they, they're fragile. And in some of these sites, uh, especially in the low country, the plow has hit these things. Some of these sites up here, we're lucky enough where it's still wooded and we have not had any plow hit uh, the artifacts so they're intact. And then other than that, what we've got here, these to me, this, even though it's iron, it is probably an amazing example of the standard clasp knife that were issued. And this was probably that soldier's go-to um, tool from shaving to whittling to doing everything he could do. Musket balls, obviously, by the dozens and dozens. Mostly this one right here. Some of the bigger ones were uh, 72 caliber, which also gives you some provenance to the British Army because the British used brown bass muskets that shot 72 caliber um, as well. There's your pennies, a, a hand forged iron key, probably to a trunk or some type of safe box. And then these little patches of lead, they would take a, uh, a, a musket ball and, and hammer them down. And this would be used to wrap the flint that went into the hammer lock of the, uh, of the musket. This, of course, a barrel tap key. That was the key that would open up the, the keg. Maybe there was, there was white men up here a lot earlier. We know DeSoto was up here in 1540, but it's, it's just an amazing little token. And then this one right here, we, we can't put anything to it. This is W. Hyde, H-I-D-E. And that's some type of token, but there's no date on it. But, but that's probably what that was, is somebody had brought it over from England, was in Charlestown, made a trade for maybe deer skin or something like that, very shiny object, and it was brought back up here in the 1660s. But to find something with that kind of date in, in, in Pickens County is quite amazing in my opinion. You will not see these very often. You'll see Civil War buttons and buckles and a lot of that stuff from a lot of guys around here, but. The, uh, the early British artifacts are, are something that you do not see very often.